Yes. Thank you very much for having me here. So today it's not going to be a talk about ice cores. It's actually it's going to be kind of two uh, two talks, two presentations. So first I'm going to start with this work we did just uh, recently, and we submitted the paper uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think, to the Frontiers, uh, and um, it's mostly based on the remote sensing, but not everything. So the motivation here, what is the motivation? Despite all the efforts and despite all the achievements in the remote sensing, which there is still a large uncertainty, especially in the regional, regional assessments of the mass losses uh, in recent decades. So that's where the uh, IPCC is now heading and uh, new reports will have these large regional assessments. But uh, so how we can actually assess the, the, the mass losses? So it's either mass balance measurements or the remote sensing, so geodetic mass balance measurements. And here is just uh, some examples which were published, published recently uh, which deals with the thousands and thousands of glaciers just by comparing and uh, the digital elevation models. Uh, I just want to uh, mention this paper here by Brun et al. In 2017, they did the whole high mountain Asia assessment and the changes of glaciers between 2000 and 2011. And uh, yeah, just to show you these uncertainties, so this was the uh, well state-of-the-art work back in 2013 based on the GRACE data. And you can see how spread these numbers are. And this uh, work stressed that actually mass balance measurements, direct mass balance measurements, glaciological one, they tend to overestimate the negative mass balance due to different reasons. The locations of that glacier, those glaciers are uh, they are located in the kind of convenient uh, valleys, so they are lower usually. And that just raised the question, do we know actually how much ice is being lost in recent decades? This work is about to be published in Nature in the next couple of weeks, hopefully. And uh, that's a new approach to uh, mass change assessment, also based on comparing glaciological and geodetic mass balances. And this is just a little illustration from the next uh, IPCC report on high mountain in the cryosphere. And you see, depending on the region, you have a very different uncertainty ranges. And so it just means that we have very a lot of data in Central uh, Europe, obviously in the Alps, and less so in the Southern Andes or in Caucasus, where there's just one well, two glaciers with the long, relatively long mass metals measurements, and none of the uh, regional geodetic mass balances was uh, published so far. So, where is the Elbrus? I think I had a talk two years ago about Elbrus Mountain. So it's Caucasus Mountains here between Black and Caspian Sea, and this is the large glaciers here. It's actually the, the, the largest kind of glacier system in the, in the, in the Caucasus. Uh, and it contains about 10% of the total, well, its area is about 10% of the total glacier coverage in Caucasus. It's volcano and uh, it feeds a lot of, actually, the, this water goes to many famous rivers, which then goes down the valley and, of course, all the agriculture depends on it. Just want to also stress that we, that glacier with the longest uh, mass balance measurement is just located here. And there is another one, uh, Garabashi Glacier, just at the Elbrus Mountain. Of course, this mountain was studied before. And there was a, a large effort during the International Geophysical Year in 50s, 1950s. And there was this book published. And then most of the studies were uh, dedicated to assessment of the special changes, so how the area or the glacial length changed. Uh, and there was the fundamental work back in 2009, which combined all the efforts uh, from Moscow State, by the Moscow State University. And actually, they assessed the changes in mass from, back in, from 1957 to 1997. 
And since then, there was no information about how masses changes. And actually, we know from mass balance measurement that last 20 years were marked by a dramatic change in glaciers in this region. Uh, just to put you in the historical context, that's a very nice work by Olga Solomina, which was published in 2016, based on the length variations and the marine dating. Uh, they uh, established that the maximum of glacier extent was uh, uh, in 1598. Well, that's the date of the uh, based on the tree ring studies, right? So, uh, and then that. Um, uh, actually, the behavior of glaciers, and here is the kind of, the, this is the length change, and this is the reconstructive temperature from the tree rings for the summer period. And the, the red is for European Alps, and the green is Caucasus. And they're essentially similar in behavior. So we want to also to compare how the mass of this glacier changes. And to add to this, all the changes are usually just reported as a change in the cubic kilometers or meter of water equivalent, but very little number of studies actually gives you an idea how much in terms of percentage was lost, right? How much of this mass was lost and how much is actually left there. Because this is a big unknown also, like how much ice is there. There are very little direct measurements. The models are still let's say, pretty inaccurate. I mean, there the recent experiment of comparing the ice thickness models showed that all of them are about 35-40% have un uncertainty or errors. And so, and then we, I will show you the, the what we did with the, so the first, so we have two kind of main data sets here. So back in 2013-14, we did this huge GPR survey using the helicopter. Uh, we, have, we obtained about 250 kilometers of GPR data profiles with uh, reflections. And so we were able to actually, uh, you cannot see it clearly here, uh, so we were able to get the ice thickness distribution and then to estimate the volume of each glacier in this Elbrus system. And then we will go to how it's actually changed. So we used this uh, GPR, which is ground, right, penetrating radar, but we built this wooden frame and put our GPR on that wooden frame and just flew over the glaciers and we had pretty nice results and it also helped that it's a volcano so you don't have um, any steep walls surrounding uh, your your GPR while you are flying because that's the main uh, source of uncertainty for these GPRs because the signal is going to be reflected from the valley walls and uh, rocks around. And just to illustrate how it's actually worked here, uh, here's a little footage. I will just skip maybe. Uh, so this is the transmitter and receiver and then the helicopter takes it with the, its non-metallic cable. It's important uh, not to have a, uh, additional reflections from, from this metal cable. And, and then it flies, and then we go over the glaciers like that. And, and then it goes back. Uh, and that's the results, just example of the results. You see the nice bedrock reflection here. and. We were surprised actually by some of the data because uh, this is somewhat so something we didn't, I'm sorry, I should have said, didn't expect like uh, the ice thickness depth here, which supposed to be a glacier tongue is actually reaches 250 meters and that's the thickest part here. And uh, this is also a kind of major breakthrough because throughout the years everybody was, were thinking that this is very shallow ice here, so, and we increased this, uh, the, the estimated volume of previous studies was way over actually uh, what was previously su su uh, suspected. And the next data set is these two dig digital elevation models from 2017 and from 1997. 
So the recent one is the Pliad uh, Dam, if you heard of this instrument. It's a French uh, uh, space agency satellite and it provides you with uh, 10 meter, well actually up to half a meter resolution uh, um, imagery and 2 meter resolution digital elevation model and with a high precision and it's been used before for assessment of, of the glacier changes in Mont Blanc and in other areas and it was provided to us by the uh, French Space Agency and the 1997 digital elevation model was uh, done by the Moscow State University of the, it was the aerial photography survey uh, and uh, so the vertical accuracies of these two models are within one and a half meters so very high resolution and very precise but and that's an important but actually uh, before you just you can of course just take two digital elevation models compare them and kind of get a results but you have to make sure that they are co-registered so geo-referenced uh, one to another or in the ideal situation you have to have a number of ground control points which we didn't have unfortunately so we went uh, to to the path of suggested in that publication Nuth and Cab so semi-automatic co-registration of two digital elevation models because if they, if they are shifted one from another then on a different map you will have these relief-like structures. So the ridges are a little bit shifted, so you will have the, yeah, the, the relief-like structure. And actually, if you were plot your data of the digital, of the surface elevation changes versus uh, aspect, you will have this sinusoidal signal here. And that's exactly what we had here. And by adjusting the parameters, so by shifting it, and you can actually calculate from this sinusoid here for how many meters you need to shift one dam one elevation model compared to another and so and then you can just uh, apply those changes and get nice results there was another problem with the Moscow State uh, University uh, model uh, it was a known issue in this part here that uh, there was some problems during one of the flights back in 1997 so we had using the statistic we showed we, we we got those bumps here so and we adjusted a little bit this area here and then also those dams were a little bit shift well uh, inclined one uh, com compared to another and we applied that correction too it actually took some time for us to figure out all those uh, changes but now we are pretty certain that they are perfectly aligned one to another so we don't have this additional uncertainty and you can see how those uh, actions actually reduce the, 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 the standard deviation uh, and um, increase the accuracy. So the final standard deviation for the non-glacier terrain was about 6.6 .6 meters, but when we actually compared the, 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 the elevation difference from f for the noon attacks, it actually went down to 3.5 meters, and that's our accuracy. I will not really stop on the uncertainty estimations because it's kind of <laughs> I can talk about it for hours or so but uh, yeah there are many uncertainties involved in, in, the, in, in this work so it's uncertainty G of the GPR, uncertainty of the uh, constructing of the um, ice thickness map uh, so it's interpolation uncertainty <coughs> then there are uncertainties of the two digital elevation models differencing and for uncertain and then it comes to uncertainty in the density uh, assumptions uh, but we calculated it all I just want to stop on this one here because there is a conservative way conservative way to way to uh, estimate uncertainty for the uh, surface elevation difference and which is just to use a standard deviation on the non glacier terrain as a measure of uncertainty so it will be some for each pixel it would it will be something plus minus 6.6 .6 meters but then of course when you calculate the average difference you are using many points many 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 data basically <coughs> and you reduce your uncertainty because your your mean 
is is the uncertainty of your mean is actually much less than the uncertainty of each point. I can, yeah, because plus minuses are uh, discarding each other and also you are looking for these so-called independent, not specially correlated values. If you have a question, I can explain to you later. But these are our results and we also, by using, at the end, because we had the 10 meter resolution models, we had 1.7 million points for statistical analysis. That's a lot. And you can see there are those outliers which we eliminated here, which is due to, these are, these are very steep um, slopes. And of course, even though you have these high resolution dam, you will have large errors in these areas. And so we deleted these outliers, and that's how we calculate the statistics for the elevation, 100 meter elevation contours. Just now we will go back to the ice thickness. So these are our ice thickness map for Elbrus Mountain. So in total, there is about five cubic kilometers of ice contained in that mountain, which seems like a large number, but I mean, it's all relative. It will be just a small iceberg from the Akamsaman Glacier and, and that's it. Uh, but for this region, it's, it's a large number. And the average thickness is about 45 meters. But more importantly, from this map, we can actually calculate how much ice is concentrated in diff different elevation beams. So, and it will tell you how much ice you're going to actually lose in, in the in future, in nearest future. And basically what it says that it's more than 60% of the total volume of those glaciers located below the, the, the equilibrium line. So they're actively melting in this lower location. And of course, it's due to those two glaciers here and here. And on the summit, there's almost no ice except for this west plateau where we were drilling in, well, just this year again, because that's a crater of the volcano. And that's where you have ice thicknesses of 250 meters. And uh, so how did these glaciers change? Uh, first, area. Area redu was reduced by about 11% in 20 years. And uh, it's, you can see the aerial change rate. And th those recent 20 years were the highest from back in Little Ice Age maximum. And we have quite a large number of these points here, right? Because there were surveys, there were maps, and uh, we can clearly see that something happened after 1997. But uh, this is our kind of clean uh, surface elevation change map. You can clearly see those two hot spots, but those glaciers which are actually contained in most of the volume of this uh, mountain. And uh, also that strikes that southern glaciers, you can just see that they tend to uh, lose mass faster than those are on the, on the north and on the west. Um, so once again, so on average, uh, glaciers were lo lost about 12.2 meters of ice, right? And uh, <coughs> But when you go to the lower elevation, of course, for in 20 years, they reduced the ice thickness by 30, 40 meters. And that's a lot. Uh, there were some interesting places on, on the western side of the mountain. Uh, well, first of all, those glaciers here are highly debris-covered glaciers. And that's something, well, this glacier here, you cannot even recognize that it's there, but it's there. <laughs> and it didn't change a lot uh, at all, I mean. Uh, but this glacier here, it's actually interesting because uh, at some point it was retreating, but then over 20 years we, we have this increase in mass. And this is, we're thinking that it's probably due to the rock fall or something here, what happened on this steep uh, slope here, which actually moved the mass towards the, 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 the tongue of this glacier. 
And using that elevation difference, we calculated the mass balance, glacier-wide mass balance for all the glaciers. And so the most mm, negative mass balance is, a cap is uh, again, for this largest glacier. It's almost one meter of water equivalent per year. Uh, but overall, glaciers will, were losing half a meter of water per year. And uh, the only glacier with positive mass balance, which is not actually a glacier as such, it's uh, kind of a body because it, the, the, only, the only way to, for it to, uh, to lose mass is those ice falls here to, to, to the west. So it locate, it's located actually above 4,500 meters, so it's just a, an accumulation zone of this glacier. And if we draw it like that, so this is the most important, well for me, the, the, uh, the way I see it uh, picture here. So we have this ice volume, which was in back in 1997, and then the ice volume in 2017. And you can clearly see where it loses the most of the mass uh, down here. And that's where the old mass is actually concentrated. And uh, the total, if you remember, the area reduced by 11%, which is more or less comparable. It's actually less than the small valley glaciers are losing in this area. And that is why in the literature, the Elbrus Mountain was always considered as a more stable because it has a higher accumulation zone than the larger accumulation zone because it's huge, so it must have been more stable. And that's why it's losing its area slower than the other valley glaciers. But if we look at the volume, at the same time, almost 23% of the ice volume was lost in just in recent 20 years. Uh, and uh, this is actually quite an uh, astonishing number. <laughs> And uh, the and below below 350 meters, 3,500 meters, uh, almost 42 percent of ice was lost. Uh, we we can draw those uh, figures for each single glacier here, and uh, you see that they are different. But uh, nevertheless, the most of the volume for all the glaciers are located. At the, at the lower elevation. So what it means, it's actually the, the area of the Elbrus Glacier may still well be mm, kind of, uh, still be quite large, <laughs> but the volume will be lost and the, the, the total volume will be definitely lost in the in, in, in nearest future. And when we are compared to previous results, we actually uh, see the increase in negative mass balance compared to the previous years by three times. So the, the, the mass loss rate tripled compared to the uh, second half of the 20th century just in the recent 20 years. And we also compared those, our geodetic results to the glaciological mass balance and it fits quite well actually. It's almost identical, uh, although there is this one meter difference over 20 years, but it's nothing. It's within the uncertainty range. Uh, so we also confirmed the glaciological mass balance, but uh, using these data, we, we will look more closely to the actually glaciological measurements in one of the glaciers in Elbrus because that's how we do so-called reanalysis of your mass balance data, glaciological data. And we already see that there are differences, so probably we have to change the methodology for glaciological mass balance measurements in this glacier. But overall, we're, we're good. So what are the possible reasons? And I will just quickly go through this. Of course, there is an increase in the summer temperature. But the thing is that the nearest weather station, which is which is actually a valley weather station. So it's located in the forest, and we are not sure that it's actually an, uh, kind of a good <laughs> site to use it for, for, for reconstruction. But that's the, 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 the closest weather station anyway. 
but it does not show that that he, such a huge increase. And when we model the mass balance, it does not really. Uh, yes, it, it tells you that the mass balance is negative, but it's not that negative as uh, as we see here. So there are probably some additional uh, factors involved. And using our I score, well, we see the other possibilities here. We, s we have an increase in black carbon, increase in dust, and we just modeled the recent dust event. Uh, it shortened the snow period, the duration of the snow cover in Caucasus Mountain by one month. You have, th there were similar works in the Alps and in the US, in Utah, where they also showed that the lar one large dust event and your snow is gone earlier by 26 or 32 days earlier and which means you have a more melting well, the longer uh, melting period and another possible reason is radiation balance because uh, according to reanalysis data uh, in in recent years from 2001 uh, there is a increase in incoming radiation and this is partly due to the change in the atmospheric circulation so we have more anticyclonic weather during the summer. Uh, but I don't have a clear answer just yet <laughs> on the exact reasons. So to conclude, uh, so from that work uh, we just showed that actually the aerial changes not necessarily tells you the the, the, the exact behavior of this glacier. You really need to look at the, how this glacier is changing its mass uh, because that is what the climatic signal is as such. So how much is ice melted this year or in that period of the year? And we also showed that uh, the, the distribution of volume is uneven on those glaciers and the most of the volume located in the lower elevation which means that they will continue to lose mass and probably the peak in runoff so, uh, will be just in the nearest future and then there will be a sharp decline in runoff. Uh, I would like to have maybe some questions to that work first and then we will go because here I'm just going to show you some photographs and, and about our recent expedition. So if you have any questions about uh, this work, please, you're welcome. <laughs>